Um, my name's Elizabeth Palfreyman, and I'm the Head of Hospice Support at Hospice UK. Um, and I was absolutely delighted to be asked to think of a session for the, the conference, because one of my roles is fundraising support for members, and I'm getting a lot of questions about legacies. Either we've had a bumpy year, or where have they gone? We haven't had one in a year, 18 months. Um, there doesn't seem to be any in-between at the moment. Um, and as a sector, um, we seem to be a bit sort of squeamish about talking about legacies. Um, we, we're just about talking about death now, but we're very British when it comes to talking about legacies and, and asking people, would they, they leave us one? Um, and yet, for hospices, some hospices, it's up to 40% of their income comes from legacies. So if you haven't had one for 18 months and you're relying on for 40% of your income, we've got some problems in the sector. Um, as they reach maturity, um, the children's hospices are now neck and neck with adult hospices. So 20% of, of generally of, of children's hospices income is from legacies and 20% for adults, which is really interesting because in the past, children's hospices have traditionally lagged behind. Therefore, this is a huge income stream and from personal experience having worked locally, um, we always worry about our legacy income and yet maybe we don't do very much about matching that worry with positive actions to bring legacies in. So I'm delighted today to introduce our speakers. If you've come to conference before, you may recognise Meg Abdi. Meg um, founded a consultancy aptly named Legacy Foresight. And Meg and the team have worked with Hospice UK and our members um, are on this issue of legacies and um, in memoriam giving, looking at the data behind that which helps you to shape your strategies. And then we have Chris Millwood. Now Chris tells me, and I've seen Chris speak, he has a real passion for legacy fundraising, having both been a fundraiser for many years, headed up the Institute of Legacy Management, and now is the director of Legacy Voice, a leading legacy consultancy. And for the next hour, they're going to provide us with an insight into the state of the current legacy market. But I've also asked Chris in particular to turn the legacy, traditional legacy narrative on its head. So often when I pick up legacy literature for hospices, it talks about what the legacy will do for the hospice. And Chris is going to get you thinking about what does leaving a legacy do for the donor and how once we understand that, that can really have a huge impact on the way we approach the subject of asking for a legacy. So, just before we start, can I just, I like to, always like to know who's in the audience. So, can I ask, have we got any legacy fundraisers in the audience? Don't be shy. Okay. Any fundraising directors? CEOs? Oh, lots of those. Trustees? Brilliant, thank you. Just, I'd just like to, to, to get a, a hold and see, see who's, who's interested in this, this topic. So without further ado, I shall hand over to Meg. Right, thank you, Elizabeth. It's a great pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to thank Hospice UK and Elizabeth particularly for inviting us to speak. Um, I don't know who's in charge of the lights up there, but it's absolutely blinding. So if it's possible to turn it down just a little bit, it would help. But otherwise, I assume you're all out there somewhere, and I'll carry on regardless. Oops. So I want to talk today about uh, the big picture trends that are driving legacy incomes, and to give you our view on the current situation and what we think is going to happen over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, and talk about what that means for the sector overall, but obviously particularly to focus in on what it means for hospices. <clears throat> Before I do that, I just want to explain who I am, where I've come from, just to give you a bit of the background. Elizabeth did a fantastic introduction, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but Legacy Foresight specialise in legacy and in in-memory giving, and we pr provide benchmarking, analysis, research, and forecasting services. And it all began 24 years ago as a one-off project that Chris, not this Chris, another Chris, my co-director and I were involved in when we were at a think tank called the Henley Centre for Forecasting. And we produced a 20-year forecast for legacy incomes. And it's kind of just grown from there over time. 
Um, and today we work with well over 100 British charities, and we also have a Dutch project, and we may be going to work in Australia as well, which is very exciting. So the information that I'm going to be drawing on today for this presentation is mainly from something called Legacy Monitor, which is a benchmarking program that we run, run with over 80 charities involved. And we provide quarterly benchmarking reports, an annual health check of each charity's legacy income, and a kind of a state of the nation report on the legacy sector. We always produce a summary report on the State of the Nation report, which is freely available to everybody. So if you're interested, if you go to our website, which is www.legacyforesight.co.uk, if you find the Legacy Giving 2018 report, you can access that there. Um, I've shown a list of the charities in the current consortium, and if you'll see, if you're very eagle-eyed, that there's three hospices involved in that, so St Christopher's, Princess Alice and Wakefield Hospice. So how do people use the service? Why do they get involved? And I think the most important thing is about separating the trends from the noise because there is an awful lot of noise in the legacy sector. And as you all know, just as well as I do, it's an incredibly volatile income stream on a year-by-year -year basis. So it's partly about kind of sense checking where your performance sits in relation to other organisations. Are you doing well? Are you doing badly? Is what you're seeing just a blip or is it a long-term trend? It's also really useful when it comes to internal education, so to help people inside the organisation to understand what drives legacy income and to try and avoid some of the kind of knee-jerk reactions that you often seem to get particularly, I would say, from boards of trustees and senior management teams, sometimes either when you're doing particularly well or particularly badly, assuming that that's the way it's going to be forevermore. It's used for budgeting. It's used for competitor intelligence. I know you don't like the word competitor, but understanding how peer charities are operating. Um, it's used for income forecasting, and it's used for strategic planning. So a wide range of uh, different forms of in insight. I should also say that although we don't have many clients in the legacy field, we have worked with a lot of hospices on our In Memory Insight programme, which we run in collaboration with Hospice UK. And there we've worked with 24 hospices over the last four years. So you might be wondering why a think tank was employed to look at what's happening in legacy income and to produce forecasts. And that's because legacies are driven by three things. They're driven by economics, they're driven by demographics and social trends, and they're driven by marketing. Those three factors together explain most of what goes on at a macro level when it comes to legacies. So first of all, just setting the scene. Uh, Total legacy income across the sector as a whole is worth 2.96 billion, so let's call it 3 billion pounds. And that might sound like a lot of money, well it is a lot of money, but it's only about 3.5% of all the money that's left in people's estates every year. And the rest of it will tend to go to family and friends. Again, if you look at the sector across the whole, as a whole, legacies is 16% of voluntary income, and it's 8% of total income. As Elizabeth has said, for hospices, it's higher. So I think the latest hospice accounts data suggests that it's 20% of voluntary income. So it's a really significant source of funds. And overall, 6% of deaths result in a charitable will with an average of three gifts per will. So often, people will leave just one gift. Some people will leave five gifts. Some people will leave 10 gifts. Very occasionally, people leave 100 gifts to different charities. It's a very wide spread. If you look at legacy income over the last 25, 30 years, it's a very, very buoyant source of income overall. So in all but four of the last 30 years, legacy incomes have risen year on year. And if you look at the last 25 years, the average annual growth has been 4.5% a year, so well above inflation. But if you look in more detail at the patterns within that 25-year period, what you see is that it's very cyclical. And those cycles depend on what's going on in the wider economy, which is not surprising because 
people's estates, the money that they're leaving, reflect their houses, their financial assets, the cash underneath the mattress, the odd yacht if you're particularly wealthy, the odd Maserati if you're lucky enough to be RNLI. And all of those financial assets are driven by what's going on in the economy at the time. So we can see that there's periods when it's been growing very fast, like the mid-90s through to the mid-noughties, and then periods when income is much more slow and occasionally, just occasionally, actually drops back, like it did at the beginning of the financial crisis in 2007, 2008. The next point I want to make, and I'm, I apologise if I'm teaching grandmothers to suck eggs here, but is there's two different types of legacy. So there's the cash gifts, which are often called pecuniary gifts, and those tend to be relatively small amounts, so maybe 500 quid, 1,000 pounds, average value 4,000 pounds, and just about half of all the legacies that are left are cash gifts. They're really important, they're really valuable, they're extremely heartfelt, but... They're relatively small compared to these other residual gifts where somebody is leaving a share of the rest of the estate to a charity. And the average residual gift is now worth £60,000. Um, and in some cases, it's much more. So across our consortium, larger residual gifts, so that's ones that are worth over £100,000, account for 8% of all the gifts that they receive but they account for 57% of all their income. So, again, you know this from your own experience. That's what makes legacy income so incredibly volatile year on year. If you get one or two exceptionally large bequests, then you get a good year. If you don't happen to get them in that particular year, income drops back quite significantly. So it's very much the luck of the draw, particularly, I guess, if it's a smaller charity where you get a relatively low number of legacy gifts. <coughs> Excuse me. But the same thing applies if you're a large charity too. So all of our clients see quite a lot of volatility in their income. Even Cancer Research UK, which gets about £180 million a year in legacy income, they'll get the occasional £10 million legacy come through, and that will throw their figures, and they all go and do a little dance somewhere. So the value of those residual bequests are very closely linked to house prices and what's going on in the housing market. And again, it's no surprise given that properties are the largest proportion of most people's estates. It's around 50% of estate values. So when house prices are rising strongly, you seem to see a, an improvement in legacy incomes. If they're slowing down or if they're falling back, then you see legacy incomes reflect that. And obviously, there are big differences in house prices across the UK. So, and those differences have actually widened since the global recession in 2008. So London house prices are, as you all know, massively higher than the rest of the country. The southeast, the east of England, southwest are all above average. And the rest of us poor buggers living in places like Yorkshire, like me, see house prices much lower. And that's also reflected in legacy incomes by region. So... The southeast, the southwest, and the east of England, interestingly, not London, which is rather different, have the highest share of total legacy income and also the highest number of people that leave a gift in their will to charity. And I'll maybe come back to that a bit later. So, where are we now? Now, I started using this picture in autumn 2016 just after the referendum struck. And I've been using it ever since because it feels like it's just as relevant now as it was then. And to me, on a personal level, this kind of sums up how I'm feeling about the economy and society at the moment. I feel like I'm cycling through this pea super and I've absolutely no idea where I'm going. And Brexit is obviously... It's not the only contributing factor, but it's obviously a hugely important contributing factor, particularly at the moment. So there's so much uncertainty about there, about have we got a divorce settlement, haven't we got a divorce settlement, let alone what are our trade terms going to be going forward with the EU and the rest of the world. And that's 
obviously having an impact on legacy values along with the rest of the economy. <clears throat> and I don't know if any of you had time to look at the news first thing this morning, but the uh, government is bringing out its own predictions for the impact on the economy of Brexit later on today. And I don't know if the Telegraph's got a leaked copy or if they're just making up the numbers, but according to them, if we crash out of Brexit without a deal, the impact on the economy over the next 15 years is going to be about £150 billion, pounds, so £10 billion pounds a year. If we manage to make a deal over the next few weeks, there'll still be a financial impact on the economy, but it will be less, so it'll be about £40 billion pounds over the next 15 years. So if you look at the growth in legacy incomes over the last five years, really after the recession finished in 2012, we had very good growth. So it was growing about 6.2% a year, and that included the period immediately after Brexit. So house prices were still rising, the economy was still quite buoyant, employment was rising, share prices internationally were doing very well, although they were a bit all over the place. But if we look forward over the next five years, we're expecting to see quite a significant slowdown. And in fact, that's already starting to come through in our own consortium data, where income is still growing, but it's growing much more slowly than it was, say, a couple of years ago. So our central prediction for the legacy market over the next five years, and this is assuming that we do manage to make a deal in the, with the EU over the next few weeks, is that incomes will grow by 2.4% a year. That's not bad. You know, it's, it's growth, not as much growth, but it, it's good growth. So that's, I think, quite acceptable. If we do crash out of the EU without a deal, then the impact is likely to be much more extreme. And uh, particularly, people are talking about, I'm sorry to be depressed and miserable on a Wednesday morning, but people are talking about house prices falling, particularly in London, particularly in the southeast and a knock-on effect on jobs and a knock-on effect on um, people's spending power. So on that basis, if we get a, a crash-out deal, instead of £15.8 billion over the next five years, which is our central forecast, we're expecting 14.6% billion over the next five years. So effectively a loss of £1.2 billion to the UK charity sector. But it's not all doom and gloom, and I'm glad I'm in an audience here where I feel I can say this without uh, too much uh, shock horror. Um, but if you look at the, the demographic factors as opposed to the economic factors, then we do know that deaths are going to rise, and deaths have been rising, in fact, since 2012. Partly cold winters, partly hot summers, partly austerity measures, potentially... But the main reason that deaths are starting to rise is because of the baby boomer generation who are now in their 60s through to their early 70s. It's such a large group that although there's only small numbers of them dying at the moment, it is having an impact on the death rate overall. So that's going to have a significant impact on deaths over the next 40 years. The trend is going to be upward over the next 40 years, particularly amongst that elderly 75 plus age group. Now I guess for hospices that's a bit of a double-edged sword because obviously it means, as I'm sure you've been discussing the last few days, a huge increase in the demand for your services, but it does also mean that it's likely to lead to more legacies being left. So a little bit of a counterbalance going on. And as I mentioned, the growth in deaths is going to be uh, driven by the baby boomer generation. And the baby boomer generation is very, very different in terms of its attitudes and its behaviour and its lifestyles to the group that's gone before it, who we call the war babies. It's a large group. It's generally very affluent, despite what's been going on in the economy. Um, they've benefited from universal state education, the National Health Service, rising house prices, occupational pensions... They're worried about what's happening to their kids and their grandchildren, but financially, for a lot of the boomers, not all of them, they're quite secure financially themselves. They're also 
a very uh, confident, well-informed, demanding, even bolshy group of people. And that's reflected in the way that they deal with all the suppliers that they work with, including charities. So when you interview people in that war baby group about their legacy, it tends to be very much a sort of a sense of obligation, a sense of giving something back, not expecting anything in return. But if you talk to the baby boomers, it's almost like they're making an investment or they're making a transaction. And so they expect to, to have things back from the, from the organisation that they're giving that money to. So we hear things like, I want to picture the difference my money will make. It's got to be tangible. I want to know that my money is being used well and not getting lost in the system. So trust is very important and transparency. And even that sense that they want to be able to control what's going on from beyond the grave. So they're much more likely, for instance, to say, I want to leave my gift to a specific project or a specific place or even sometimes a specific nurse or a specific program so that I know that money is being spent properly. Now, the third factor, apart from economics and demographics, is marketing. And obviously, charity marketing has had an effect. And what we've seen over the last... 20 years, 24 years, maybe since we started working on this, was a shift in the types of organisations that are receiving legacies. So 20 years ago, really, the market was dominated by a few very big, very well-known national brands. So people like the Royal National Institute for the Blind, the Royal National Lifeboat Institute, Bernardo's, the Children's Society, sort of stort pillars of the community, if you like. But over time, where the growth is coming from is from younger, smaller, more contemporary causes, the sorts of organisations to the right-hand side of the screen. So these are quite small in terms of legacy income at the moment, but a lot of the dynamism is coming from there. So rescue services like air ambulances, arts organisations, NHS hospitals, environmental charities, overseas development charities, and hospices. Now, if I did this chart... A couple of years ago, hospices would have been right on the right-hand side of the scale. So they would have been one of the fastest-growing sectors across the board. Interestingly, perhaps we'll come back to it a little later, hospices are now lagging behind. They're not seeing as much growth as some of those other organisations are. And I think it's to do with the way that those other organisations are grabbing hold of the marketing and really getting out there. And perhaps hospices are being a little more reticent and quiet about their attractions, if you like. So that's what's happening overall. In terms of the hospice sector specifically, hospices, health is by far the largest sector in legacies, so about 40%, two pounds out of every five that's left in legacies goes to health organisations. And the biggest category overall is cancer, so Cancer Research UK, Macmillan, Marie Curie particularly. The second biggest group is hospices, but it does tend to be a very fragmented group, so something like 150 hospices in the top 1,000 legacy charities with about a million pounds legacy income each, compared to Cancer Research UK with its 180 million and Macmillan with its 60, 70 million pounds. You'll see as well National Health Hospitals doing well, and air ambulances are the fastest growing sector, although they are pretty teeny at the moment. <coughs> when it comes to growth by those subsectors, then as I kind of hinted at before, the hospice sector seems to be lagging behind the other health organisations, particularly the smaller ones. So your growth over the last five years was 6.4% compared to 7% for all health charities. Now, obviously, that's not a dramatic difference, but maybe it's just a pause for thought and something to uh, consider. We also see a widespread of incomes by type of by hospice. So as I said, the average per hospice charity is 1.1 million. Some charities receive quite a lot more. And I think if you looked at the top, the four or five on the left-hand side of that screen, yeah, left, yeah, St Christopher's, Princess Alice, St Barnabas, St Anne's, Children's Hospice Southwest, these always tend to be at the top of the rankings. They always seem to do relatively well in legacy income. And you'll know better than I do why that might be. The other relatively large ones vary a lot from year to year, 
because they may or may not get some extra large legacies. So this is looking at average legacy income over a three-year period, so it's ironing out some of those impacts. But even so, there's a lot of sort of dancing around when it gets beyond the top five. And southern hospices tend to receive the most legacy income. And that comes back, I think, to house prices again. So we did some analysis this year of all 150 hospices, grouped them into region, and what we found is the ones in Greater London, the southwest and the southeast, tended to get higher average income than the ones in the, the northwest, northeast Wales, for example. Last year, we did a project with a, a small group of hospices in the southeast, and we were able to access their data at a more detailed level and do some really interesting benchmarking work on what was going on, what was driving those particular charities' income. Um, it was led by Princess Alice Hospice. I don't know whether anyone from Princess Alice is here in the room today. Nigel Seymour was the one that instigated it, and I think it was a really interesting project, but it was quite a small sample of charities to work with. And there were three key lessons that came out of that research that I wanted to just share with you. The first one is that if you look at the growth overall, this is over a five-year period, those hospices were doing really well compared to the charities across our Legacy Monitor Consortium. So income grew by 6.3% for that group compared to 5.4% for the Legacy Monitor group as a whole. But what was pushing up their income was their values. It wasn't the numbers. And again, I think if you look at the charities in that group, they were hospices in the southeast of England, often in quite wealthy areas. House prices probably had a big impact on how much they were growing. That's not necessarily going to be the case going forward. The growth in numbers of legacies that they were receiving was actually quite a lot lower than we were seeing across the board. So what they weren't doing is gaining ground, gaining share in terms of numbers of legators. Another interesting fact was that even more than general, the hospices in this group were reliant on a very small number of very large bequests. So the larger residual bequests accounted for 10% of all the gifts that they received, and they accounted for two-thirds of the legacy income. So that obviously has implications, again, for the volatility of the income and for the ability to manage that income and to manage the impact of the income on the organisation. And the third point is that the amount of money that was invested in legacy fundraising was incredibly low. So, yeah, I know they're hospice. I know you don't have the budgets that the big organisations have. But even relative to the size of the organisation, the amount of money and the amount of people that was being invested in legacy fundraising was incredibly low. So... The eight charities together spent £70,000 a year on legacy fundraising, so they received £230 of legacy income for every pound that they spent. Well, you might, a finance director might say, that's a really good return on the investment. Great, let's continue. Um, they employed, across the whole eight organisations, two full-time equivalent legacy fundraisers. So again, those fundraisers were working very hard in terms of the amount of money that they were getting back. Now, you could argue that's efficient management, but I think I would say that it's a lost opportunity because if you were to invest more money, even a bit more money, you could generate a lot more income. And I think Chris will come on to talk about that in a bit more detail. So the last point I want to make before I hand over to Chris is really just to sort of summarise what I think is going on uh, from what we've seen in legacies for hospices. So clearly, they're a vital source of income for you. They're a fifth of your total income. And although the current situation is a bit murky, it's really hard to tell what's going to happen, if you look beyond the next five years, it's good news because the legacy market is set to grow thanks to rising boomer deaths. I apologise to all the boomers in the room. It's going to happen to all of us at some point, me included. But that is a positive demographic factor as far as uh, legacies are concerned. It's an incredibly competitive market, and it's getting more competitive. So you can't afford just to sit back and thank and bank. You've got to do more than that if you want to keep your share. And you need to grow the number of bequests that you receive, not just rely on the odd windfall gift. Investment in people and budgets is very low, even relative to your size. 
But the good news is that you have a really natural, emotional and practical connection to legacy donors. So my feeling is that there's a real opportunity to grow the number of people who give if you're able to more proactively and in a more integrated way to market legacies. So I'm going to leave you there and I'm going to hand you over to Chris. Bear with, just sort myself out. So, good morning everybody. Um, Meg set the scene really well there in terms of you know, the broader context um, and indeed the opportunity. Um, and I want to share with you that I believe the true potential of leg legacy giving is actually yet to be realised. Um, so some good news for a change. Um, and that's for charities, for beneficiaries, um, but I think most importantly actually for, for donors who, believe it or not, often get forgotten when we're talking about legacy fundraising and legacy marketing. Um, legacies have always been a very personal thing, but actually I think as a sector historically we focused a bit too much on process rather than people. So at Legacy Voice we've worked with several hospices and hopefully have a bit of insight into some of the challenges but also the opportunities um, that we, th we think you're, you're presented with. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about the literature review that we also undertook um, that, that starts to help us understand the broader situation a little bit better. So the legacy gifts that supporters leave are, are a genuine reflection of, of their lives, the things that they care for, the things that they're passionate about, and, and, and truly how, how they want to be remembered once they've gone. So people give in this way because it makes them feel happier. Legacy giving brings a unique value to people by improving self-esteem and giving a renewed sense of purpose and value towards the end of their lives. And at Legacy Voice, our ambition is a world where everyone can feel that joy. And as Legacy Fundraisers, I think that's the most amazing thing that we are able to, to give to people. So there's a quote there from Stephen Eastwood, who worked with Mountbatten um, to create the documentary called Island. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but if you haven't, I would really urge you to, to hunt it out. It's had a relatively limited release, but it's, it's a truly moving and inspiring piece. And what I think it demonstrates really well is the unique position that, that you as hospitals occupy, both within society, but also within people's hearts. And I think you've got a critical role to play, therefore, in helping people to experience the joy of legacy giving that, that I mentioned earlier. And th there's a win-win here, because you're also uniquely placed to benefit from those actions yourselves. And more legacy giving can help generate more income and make your organisations more sustainable, which in turn means you can help more people. So as Meg mentioned, the legacy market is, is due to grow. It's actually set to double between now and, and 2050, Brexit notwithstanding, fingers crossed. Um, and we're, we're standing on the, the precipice of a, a once-in-a-lifetime, never-to-be-repeated, and I think that's really important, opportunity over the next 30 years as the baby boomers die and their wealth is, is passed on to, to future generations, but also hopefully to causes that, that they care for. But we do have a problem. Whilst they're alive, about 70% of people support charities by giving regular donations, one-off gifts, running events. Sadly, by the time they come to die, only about 6 or 7% of them decide to leave a gift in their will. I think this quote sums it up. Uh, Professor Russell James, who's a, an American academic, 
You know, without more effective legacy fundraising practice, 90% of donor mortality will only result in loss given, which I think is quite a sad situation. Um, but that's, that's, that's where we are, notwithstanding the opportunity that we face. And the Remember a Charity campaign have looked at this, and there's a lot of people out there who are willing to consider it. You know, just 45 minutes talking to a donor is enough to encourage them to actively consider leaving a gift in their will. And I, I think that's the role that, you know, as legacy fundraisers, we have to play. We have to be encouraging those conversations. Um, so the research that I mentioned earlier, um, turns out there's actually quite a lot of research out there about legacy giving, um, but it's quite hard to reach. It's behind paywalls. Um, it's, it's quite impenetrable because some of it's very academic. Um, and the problem there is, unless we really understand legacy giving, we'll never really be able to do it well. And as it turns out, legacy giving is actually quite, quite different to lifetime giving. And if we don't get it right, we're going to miss out on billions of pounds for the sector that could help us do great work. And I think that, that's quite a sad thought. So we commissioned the research, um, we pulled together the academic findings and these different papers. Um, it's available on our website, the address is there on the screen, it's free to download, so I would encourage you to, to go and have a look at it, but what I'll do for you today is just top line the key findings from that research. So 75% of the population are actively motivated to die with a positive net worth and leave something behind for future generations. People want to know their life meant something. They want to know it's been worth it. And they want to know that they've made a difference. These are, these are really powerful, powerful emotions. And I think legacy giving offers hospices the opportunity to provide you know, enhanced care, emotional and spiritual support that, that taps into to these desires that people have. Um, so I think that's something to consider, you know, kind of said another way. Once, once we've met those basic human needs, people move up, up that pyramid and they're, they're into the, the higher levels, which are, you know, about having, having made their mark and their life, having had value and meaning. And I think that's a space that is, is, is less explored in legacy giving, but actually I think you as hospices are in a really powerful place to to help people have those conversations and to, to re reflect upon their lives in that way. So people of ages make wills and leave legacy gifts. Now there are social norms, and the older we get, the more likely we are to have a will, um, and as we've seen earlier, the proportion of people who will actively consider leaving a gift is you know, high, although the proportion that go on to do it is, is, is significantly lower. But I think when you're thinking about who to talk to about legacy gifts, don't, you know, don't dismiss people because they're not 60, 70, 80. Um, young people need wills as much as old people do, and you know, it's about providing holistic care and support to, to the people that you know, come, come through your doors. And I think will writing and legacy giving should, should always be considered in terms of whether or not it, it's appropriate, and it will bring benefit to anyone who does it. So we touched on this. Most people die with a will. And actually, reducing intestacy is unlikely to increase legacy giving. So a lot of legacy fundraising campaigns are, are about getting people to write wills. But the reality is, most people have them. So the challenge we're faced with is how do we get them to reconsider those decisions? How do we get them to revisit those wills? And how do we ensure that we're their front of mind at the moment when, when they do do that? And I, I would suggest we do it by inspiring them through the potential that their gifts can have. So let's not talk about will writing. Let's, let's focus on legacy giving. Meg mentioned driving value as much as volume. Now, a few high value gifts will have much more significant impact than a larger volume of lower ones. So I think value is really, really important and it's often forgotten when people think about legacy giving. 
So wills and legacy gifts indeed are changed and updated through life. They are life-driven decisions. You know, as we go through life, our perspective on our, you know, our sense of self-worth or our, our, our value or the things that we really care for change. Um, this diagram is overly complicated, but it's here so you can have it in your slide pack. But the, the literature review kind of led us to reevaluate the way in which we understand how people make decisions about legacy giving. Um, and a lot of legacy fundraising and marketing activity is actually in a, a very functional space. A will writing scheme is a functional response. The reality is people start in an emotional place when they're thinking about legacy giving. You know, what's their life, you know, been, you know, what's been important to them? How do they want to be remembered? What values do they want to pass on to future generations? We then sense check that within our peer network, our communities, just to check that we're not doing anything that, that feels out of step with what society might expect. And I, I think that's, that's quite a sad step in a way, and it's probably quite limiting. In, if you're a, a cause that's less popular and trying to break through, then that, that's the point at which you might get filtered out because causes like yours don't get supported by people like me. Um, I think then they look at, at causal area very, very broadly, and then they look specifically at organisations and the gift. And as Meg was saying, do they leave you a share of their estate? Do they leave you a specific small gift? You know, it's literally a reflection of the share of heart that you have um, with that person in terms of what, what comes through. So that'll, that'll be in the deck. But just to say, that process will be revisited through life. As, as priorities change, as, as, as people's personal wealth you know, fluctuates, as you retire, as you buy a house, as you marry, these things will trigger a reconsideration of those, those sorts of decisions and, and priorities will, will change. So stories and storytelling, really powerful. Um, an example here of a story that we uncovered when we worked with St Catherine's Hospice. Um, I won't read it out, I'll let you read it for yourself, but I think it demonstrates really well, you know, the critical role that hospices have, the place that you have in people's lives and their hearts, and how really small things can make a massive, massive difference in terms of how people perceive you and indeed therefore how they might choose to go on and, and support you with a gift in your will. So everything that you do potentially has an impact on, on someone's decision to, to support you or not. You managed to read it? Nodding heads. Cool. I'll move on for the sake of time. Um, so, our potential donors are becoming more demanding. You know, the baby boomer generation may have a lot of wealth, but it's not just going to give it away freely. I think more and more we have to demonstrate as charities our, our impact, our efficacy. We have to build trust with, with people in order to, to show them that we will honour their, their final wishes and we'll, we'll do what they want to with, with the money. Um, it's something that people do want to, to talk about. Um, so we did some research with St Catherine's that showed that patients and family actually were really happy to talk about these sorts of issues. It was the, you know, the, the, the senior leadership team and the service delivery staff that didn't, which I think is very telling. Now there's a massive opportunity. They want to talk about it. We don't. How do we get to a point where we're, we're comfortable and, and able to, to talk about it, to be able to engage and overcome some of these, these challenges that we know, we know may come? Donors don't want public displays of recognition. Well, I don't think that's strictly true. They want appropriate recognition. They don't want anything big or ostentatious or flashy um, or too public. But, you know, they're quite happy with, you know, uh, lower level memorials or events. And indeed, I think the hospice movement is actually very good at, at providing these sorts of opportunities around, around in MEM. And why not could those be extended to, to legacy stuff? Legacy work, so the tree of light, remembrance services, gardens, benches. You know, what, what is it that, that you can offer? Because I think recognition is a really personal thing and it's, it's about what, what choices we can, we can offer people. Um, 
So this is, this is a real growing area in terms of insight and legacy foresight have done some great work in, in this area. But, but what we're finding is that organisations that actually spend more time and money on stewardship um, convert more people um, and they also convert at a higher value. So the point here is about having a process in place. It's, it's not just enough to solicit legacy gifts you have to then know what you're going to do with the responses once you've got them. So think about what underpins the program in terms of systems and process. Um, it's also important to have this sort of process in place because there are some quite critical issues with, with the kind of legacy journey itself. You, know, you need to make people aware. And the, big, the biggest barrier to, to most people's consideration is that the organisation hasn't told them it's an option or they haven't made the case for, for legacy gifts in terms of how they help to provide the, the critical support and services that, that the organisation delivers. And we have the 35% of people who say they would actively consider it, yet only 6 or 7% go on to do it. So we're losing people at that stage in the process as well. Why are we not converting people who said they would actively consider it, and what is it we can do within our programmes once someone's raised their hand and said they are interested in order to be able to to move them forward. And then the ticking time bomb is even if we get them to raise their hands, convert them and get them to pledge, after 10 years, only half of them will still be there. So how we look after people once they've made that decision, made that commitment, how we steward those gifts, how we demonstrate impact, how we continue to build trust, show efficacy, is really, really important. And as we've seen, the, the organisations that are investing in this are the ones that are most successful in both converting people to, to, to leave gifts, but also in retaining them and generating high-value gifts. So there are some very functional benefits to will writing, but legacy giving can provide so much more. Particularly in later life, and helping, in terms of helping people to, to age well. It gives them purpose and it connects them to community, which is what the research tells us are the kind of two really critical things in terms of um, growing old well. It can help you put your affairs in order. It can help you to look after the people that you're leaving behind. It gives a sense of purpose um, and re re renewed meaning in your life if you're supporting a cause and you're part of that broader community. It gives back purpose. Um, there's something very positive that comes from being able to support a cause that reflects your own personal values and to, to have that, that affinity. And there's the, the piece about living on, being remembered. Symbolic immortality is something really, really important, and it, 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 it's part of our coping mechanisms in terms of how we deal with death, is knowing that it doesn't just end. It has been worth something, and that it will live on, whether that's in our values or in the financial support we give organisations and therefore through, through their work. It's really, really important for people to know that, that it doesn't just end, and legacy giving can, can give them that hope. And to, this is a kind of lesser explored territory, I'll be really honest. Most charities are in the functional space, but I, I think given that share of, of heart that you guys have and the place that you play in terms of, of end of life, this could be really powerful for you. And I think it's about finding those stories and, and, and being able to express those emotional and spiritual benefits rather than perhaps some of the functional ones that often come from a conversation about will writing rather than legacy giving. So sadly, increasing competition, as Meg said, it isn't enough anymore just to be good. We need to be great. And great isn't easy, it isn't quick, and it doesn't come cheap. But I guess it's about the scale of your ambition and your vision for legacy giving within your organisation. If you're serious about it, there are some really difficult choices that need to be made, but I think you will truly reap the rewards as a result. And that investment will allow you to stand out you know, from that ever-increasing crowd, it will help you convert more of that interest into action, which we know is a critical point in the journey. And it will help you generate more high-value gifts. 
So just to finish, we believe there are five key steps to great legacy fundraising. Um, the legacy confident organisation, you need to live and breathe this. It needs to be under your skin. You need to be comfortable having these conversations. You need to be clear about what it is you're trying to achieve. It needs to be a strategic priority for your organisation, not just a tactical execution, something that's bolted on the side. It needs to be at the heart of not just, I would say, your fundraising strategy, but your organisational strategy, because we're talking about potential impact on, on service delivery and programmes to really optimise the value of legacy giving. And it needs to be a responsibility that's shared by everybody. It's not just the legacy person's job to do legacy fundraising. If it is, it will never truly be great. Might be good, might be okay, but you will never realise its true potential. You need to be really clear about your vision and your ambition. You need to know where it is you're heading, and you need to be able to recognise when you get there. And I think that needs to be expressed in two ways. Hard and financial, because you need a number on it to know what you're aiming for, and that could be you know, £10 million by 2020. It could be doubling your income in the next five years. But I think it's also important to have something that expresses it in terms of an internal purpose, given the importance of stewardship that we've seen, I think, you know, so at Save the Children, when I was there, it was to ensure everybody who believed in the cause had the opportunity to support it by leaving a gift in their will. Now, that did two things. One was everybody, which means the audience is big rather than narrow. And the more you put in at the top, the more that's likely to fall through that, that journey, as we saw. And consider. So just being aware isn't enough. It's very easy to get to 100% coverage on your base and say that you've told them about legacies, but have you actively engaged with them? Have you got them to, to consider it? And do you have the me mechanics, the tools, the confidence to, to be able to support that as part of your program? Donor-centric, not organisational. Start with the donor, start with insight. So understand the people that you're dealing with, understand their lives, their loves, their values, their motivations, why they might give. Because the really powerful stuff is when you can match people's values with the vision of your organization and find, find a way to express that most compellingly. That, that's the really powerful space. As we said, it's really personal and we need to find a way to, to link those two things, two things together. Find and tell stories. Um, and develop a compelling legacy proposition. Um, you need to be able to talk about this in a really inspiring way. I don't think giving people you know, discounted or free access to a will writing scheme is a terribly emotional ask. And actually, to be successful, fundraising needs to be emotional. And we need to find those stories. We need to feel comfortable telling them. And we need to strive for great rather than just good. And as we've said, it's not quick. It's not easy. And it's not cheap, and it's a long-term process. So we need to be thinking five, ten years out. You're not going to get quick wins from a legacy program, or you shouldn't bargain on getting quick wins. It doesn't mean that they won't come. And we need to be prepared to give people choice and control over their own stewardship, their own journey, their own relationship with our organisation, we need to be able to manage complexity and to be able to, to deal with that effectively as well. So it's a challenge. Great legacy fundraising isn't easy, but I truly believe that if we invest in the appropriate ways, and that's not just money, it's also in people. I think resource is really important, as are skills. You can drive volume on the front end of any legacy model. But once you get people through and you want to steward them, engage them, tell emotional stories, it's people that are really important and soft skills around communication and influencing and negotiation. Um, so I would urge you to consider that as well when it, if you're thinking about investing in a legacy programme. It's not just about pounds, it's about people and skills as well. So I'm going to stop there. And then I think Meg had a couple of things to add. Um, I want to talk to you very briefly just to sow a seed for an idea before the questions and I don't want to cut into question time because I know how precious that is but 
it feels like a bit of a conundrum, really, that legacy income is clearly very important to you as a sector. It's a big source of income, but it seems to be below the radar. It's quite a latent thing. There's not that much uh, investment. There's not that much embracing of it. And the opportunity is being used to some extent, but there could be just be so much more. And it seems to us, from having worked in the sector for 24 years, that there's a need there for more insight. So to understand more, some of the things that we cover in the Legacy Monitor programme with the big national charities about how are we performing relative to other hospices, but also why are we doing better or worse than other hospices? Should we be investing more money and more staff? And if so, in what types of areas? What is our long-term legacy potential? What's the risk profile of our future income, which is very important when it's so volatile year on year? And also the sort of softer stuff that Chris touched on about why do our legacy donors choose us? So there's a lot of questions out there which, as individual organisations, uh, your board are and should be considering, but also that perhaps collaboration can help to resolve. So I wanted to just sow the seed of an idea for a programme uh, to look at this in more detail. And it's a legacy monitor, but very much aimed at the hospice sector, rather like we've done with the In Memory Insight. And I don't know if there's any of you involved in In Memory Insight in the room at all. One over there, thank you. Um, so I understand why it is that we have so few hospices in the legacy monitor, because pff, do you really want to know how our SPCA is doing in legacies or help for heroes? No, you want to understand about how other hospices are doing and what that means for you. So we need to get a critical mass of hospices together. You don't have the budgets that the big organisations have. You don't necessarily have the quantity or quality of data that the big organisations have. So it would be more sensible to have a pared back version of the Monitor programme. So my vision for it long term, and I don't expect any responses today, is to, get, to bring together a group of 30 or more hospices with combined legacy income of £75 million or more and to provide a tailored annual benchmarking service, not a quarterly one, but an annual one, which looks at patterns across the group, not just income, but notifications, types of gifts, size of gifts, numbers of extra large gifts, donor profiles, and so on. Also giving access to the main legacy monitor program, so you can put your performance in the wider context, but also in return, agreeing to share some of the top-line information, not all the detail, but some information with the Legacy Monitor program. Because, not surprisingly, the big charities are very interested in understanding about hospices, as they certainly are with the In Memory Insight program. I think there's an opportunity there at the moment, because I don't know if any of you have come across uh, First Class, which is the legacy administration software that most of the big charities use to manage their legacy caseload. They are just about to launch a new cloud-based version called First Class Web, which is very much aimed at smaller legacy organisations, uh, a lower subscription fee, everything done through the cloud, can be done by staff working remotely, can be done through uh, third-party organisations on your behalf. And one of the great things about that is it means that we can access the information with your permission directly through First Class Cloud. So we don't need to come to you to ask for the information. You can, I'm simplifying massively, but you can press a button and squirt the information out to us. Um, and that would mean that we could do the analysis in a much more seamless way. And there'd be an annual seminar to debate the findings. Now there's also, that's my vision, I'm not expecting that to happen in two years time or even probably five years time. I've got a more pragmatic version of it, which I won't go through in detail, but it will be in, I assume people will get copies of the packs afterwards. And also um, that we, we're at the Legacy Fundraising Conference in February, we can talk about this in more detail. So just something to leave you with in terms of a thought. Um, that's our website. Do go and have a look for the Legacy Giving Report, and you can download that freely. So, Elizabeth, over to you for questions. This is where my maths is going to be tested because um, 
when I hear that 6% of people have left a legacy, I thought, that, let's, let's see what's going on in this room. And there's about 60 people in here. So hands up if you have left a legacy. Yeah. Hands up if you've left a legacy to a hospice. Oh, not quite so many. So I, th I think we're just about national average there. So even in this room, which is warm to legacies, I'll just leave you with that thought. OK, so um, we have Rebecca, who's armed with a mic. Has anybody got any questions for either uh, you know, Chris? Or yeah. So um, where should we start? Um, there's a gentleman in the middle here, Rebecca. I think it's West, um, Western Hospice, is it? Yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, Paul from Western Hospice Care. Um, I've heard it said that there's a, an average lag time of about five years from an effective marketing campaign to seeing an uptick in legacy income. I'm not sure I agree with that, but I just wondered if you had any data or any sort of insight into what that average lag time might be. Are these working? Yeah. Um, well, the average gap between somebody writing their last will and dying is six years. So if you impact on somebody enough to make them go out there and write their will tomorrow, it would take six years on average for that person to die. Obviously, some people do die more quickly than that. Um, but I think five years is a, a realistic, if anything, quite an optimistic estimate of how long. It might start to pick up then, but where you really start to see it bearing fruit is 10, 15 years down the line. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and I think generally people fall into two camps. There's either the more, more than 10 years old or less than two. And I, given the nature of the context in which you work, I think there is likely to be a higher proportion of people whose wills are less than two years old. Interestingly, we did look at this in the hospice benchmarking work that we did. And yes, slightly more people die within, say, two years and four years than the national picture. But it wasn't significantly different. It wasn't as much as I expected it to be. Now, whether that's because it's the next of kin who are leaving the money to the charity rather than the person who's being treated in the hospice, I don't know. You'd have a better sense of that than, than I would. Thank you. So it's very much a strategic, long-term investment. It has to be, yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. OK. Uh, Rebecca, there's a gentleman just behind Paul. Thank you. Uh, David Scott Rouse from St Wilfrid's Hospice in Eastbourne. Um, the... Hospice Legacy Monitor sounds a really interesting idea, uh, and I don't think you should necessarily expect it to take five years to get something like that off the ground. I'm just interested, if there were, say, 30 hospices interested, what you think would be a kind of cost, an annual cost for that, please? I think it's somewhere about £2,500 per charity. I haven't worked out the exact cost yet, but, but around that sort of level. The, the main legacy monitor program is £4,600 per organisation. So this would be significantly less than that, but it would be tailored to the individual charities. Okay. And if, if there is a groundswell, please contact either myself or Meg, because we want, we want this to work. Um, because it's going to mean more injections of, of finance into, into hospices. So if it's something you're, you're going away and thinking about, please give us a shout and I'll feed that information in, into Meg. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? There's some that in, Rebecca. I'm going to make you run. Um, if you want, there was... Yes. Just to... uh, Hi there. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jeff Page. I'm a trustee at the Rowan's Hospice in Portsmouth. Um, I just wondered if there's any published insight or any market research around changes in family dynamics and social dynamics um, and how that might affect future legacy income. Speaking personally for myself, having made lifetime gifts to my children and also making a greater provision for my uh, health care and social care in future years, I don't see that getting any better. No. I just wondered if there's any insight or anything you can share with us about how that may affect legacies over the uh, immediate future. Yeah. Um, I think, yes, fa families are becoming more complicated, more fragmented. Uh, I think one important point to make is that the most significant donor donors when it comes to the larger legacies are childless people. That's always been the case and always, I think, will be the case. Uh, we've spent quite a lot of time analysing 
and projecting forward the number of childless people who are going to die. <laughs> Ridiculous things we look at. But um, in fact, if you look at the baby boomer generation, particularly the younger baby boomer generation, people of my age in their 50s, a higher proportion of those people are childless. That's one of the reasons I think it's a good opportunity for the long term. In terms of care costs, um, yes, that is an issue. It is something that we've already taken into account when we do our forecasts, because the amount of wealth that's been accumulated by the boomers more than counteracts the potential impact of care costs on some individuals. I think there's more of a potential issue about social care costs being charged for in the future. So, and also, sooner or later, someone's going to have to bite the bullet and work out how we can realistically fund long-term care. And I think when that comes through, we need to look at that very carefully. But overall, the impact is, is less than you might imagine from long-term care costs, from the, from the work that we've done and the data we've got from people like Joseph Rowntree, for instance. Okay, so if you focus on the bit, uh, widows and <laughs> Without children. Don't let them meet and marry up. <laughs> goodness, goodness well, they won't be having any more kids by that yeah, age no, anyway. Okay. So. Um, I'm really sorry. Whoever's controlling the lights, please can you bring them up because Meg's struggling and I'm, I'm actually struggling to see um, people out there. So could you just bring the light, house lights right up for us so we can see? Okay, okay. Should have bought my sunglasses. Well, maybe the ones that are blinding us could just go down a little bit. Lovely. Then it might make it easier. Lovely. That's better. Right, ah, Rebecca, there's a, a gentleman just slightly up the stairs. Thank you. Hi, I'm Prabhaka Sundaresan from um, St. Luke's Hospice in London. I'm new to the sector and also to uh, the hospices world. The question I have is very basic in terms of how does one budget for legacies in, in order to manage the costs and, and, and the financials properly? Is there any material you can point us to where we can find some basis? I can give... Uh, what I used to do, um, but I, I don't know if, if you guys have got more insight on that one. Um, the charity fundraising group does a, um, has a leaflet on how to apply SOAP in relation to legacy giving, so that might give you the kind of more formal kind of guidelines around it. I, I would also suggest you talk to some other hospices and see how they're accounting for legacy income. Um, the other thing you could do is look at the Institute of Legacy Management, which has good practice guidance around legacy giving, accruals, recognising income, forecasting as well. So there are some pieces out there that can, can help you start to think about it. And, I mean, okay. compliance is the important bit in terms of how you account. Mm. Yeah, my question was more about budgeting, not the, yeah. the, the recognition. Yeah, yeah. Gen generally... Average it out. I used to do the last five years, and I would strip out if we had an unexpectedly good year and reduce it down. Because if you've, I, I, the hospice I work for, we about three hundred thousand was the average, and then one year someone very kindly left us nearly two million pounds. If I average that out, it skews the budgeting figures. So I just pulled that year back to the average three hundred thousand. Um, but it's it's difficult. Um, it, and the danger is relying on that income. Yeah. I think the other thing that I would say is to look at the numbers of bequests that you're getting rather than the values of the bequests and split it out by type. So as I mentioned about cash gifts versus pecuniary gifts, cash gifts I think are reasonably easy to predict, but the large pecuniaries, the residuals, are the ones that always throw you out. So if it was me, I'd treat those as exceptional and a windfall rather than assume you're going to get them or if you're doing often we're doing forecasting for smaller organizations we might say produce a five-year forecast and assume that you're going to get two over that five-year period for example rather than say in one year you're likely to get a particular value if that makes sense yeah. okay thank you but there'll be um all you, we have um hospice iq on our website uh, which is a, qu a place for people to ask questions and for other hospices to come back with answers because really there's nothing new. So if you, if you come onto the website and post that question, someone out there will, will, will help you. So please, please don't worry. Did I see another hand go up? Yes. Thank you. Uh, David Badger from Dorothy House Hospice Care based in near Bath. Uh, just to build on Paul's question um, from Weston on the length of time, we've just con uh, concluded a 10-year research project on the gifts that we've had in the last 10 years and our average is just over four and a half years. 
Uh, I'm not sure that's worth anything, but I just wanted to pick up on Paul's question. Um, that for, our, uh, for us, we think we can influence that as part of our five-year plan. And it's what happens during that, that 10 years in people's lives and, and actually how you can turn people off. Absolutely, that's the next part of our research. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Any other questions? No? Oh, no, it's one here. One here, lovely. <laughs> I like this. Adrian from McClure Solicitors. Um, some of the people in the room will know us because we are partnered with some people in the room. Uh, we just met the Dorothy House last week. Um, we specialise in estate planning. We uh, do roughly about 6,000 appointments a year. Uh, and the point I would like to make to everyone in the room is that you must educate your solicitors because most solicitors do not talk about legacies. So don't forget the solicitors in your planning of, of, of uh, legacy giving. We find that the majority of clients do not know what a legacy is. They associate a legacy with the old lady that left millions of pounds to a cat home. And they don't associate with leaving a hundred pounds or a thousand pounds or one percent or five percent of their income to, to, to charity. We will raise this year 44 million pounds for charity through pledge legacies because we understand it. 29% of our wills will have a legacy in them. There's some food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question here from the lady in pink. Yes, I saw it. Um, Marcia from St. Wilfred's Hospice in Chichester. Um, and I was just going to bring up the point that we actually meet with our local solicitors and build that relationship with them and Good. getting our legacy administrator, who's not me, it's someone else, but to meet with them and say, can you help encourage the solicitors to, you know, m talk with the, the donors and make them understand what we do. So I was just adding that. Yeah, and I think that's one big advantage that you guys have, that you are operating in a, a relatively tight catchment and you have the opportunity to get to know the solicitors and the funeral directors and the, and the businesses in the local area and to sort of spread the word through those organisations to your potential clients, potential clients, potential donors compared to somebody at a national level that's trying to reach out across the whole country, which is much more amorphous somehow, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and don't forget your lottery players. I, I heard from a hospice last week, um, and they had uh, received a legacy of a quarter of a million pounds, and they couldn't work out where this, what the connection was, and it, a lot, little bit of research, and it was one of their lottery players, um, pound a week for several years. Um, but that constant because the money was coming out of the account, contact, and he'd left them a, his house worth a quarter million pounds. So, um, and I've heard that again and again, that lottery actually is quite an interesting source of, of legacies. Any final questions before I, I thank Chris and Meg? No? Just before I do that, um, I would be very amiss not to try and upsell um, Meg made reference. Um, we have a fundraising conference, and this year it's a whole day dedicated to legacy fundraising, a, a deep dive into legacy fundraising. And Rebecca's got leaflets, so we'll, we'll, we'll nab you as you go out. Um, looking at every aspect from a slightly more in depth version of, of Meg and, and Chris, um, we have the Cystic Fibrosis Trust coming to talk about how they train every member of their staff to talk about legacy fundraising, which is a point I think Chris made about everybody's a legacy fundraiser. We have uh, the consortium uh, in Cumbria who've done a regional legacy fundraising campaign talking about how that's been working. Um, and also someone giving the view from the executors of how sometimes charities turn off future legacies by the way they treat the executors of those who very kindly left a legacy. So it'll be a, a really, really good day. I'm not just saying that because I'm organising it, um, but lots and lots more in, information and some really meaty stuff to, to think about. But on that final note, I'd like uh, a round of applause for Meg and for Chris. Thank you.